For me, this is not only a journey into the past, but also the opportunity to pay tribute to a friend, Ivo Peters, whose name is synonymous with the old Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. Much of Ivo's filming and photography was undertaken on the northern section of the line between Bath and Midsummer Norton and on over the rugged Mendip Hills to Shepton Mallet and to Evercreech Junction. The Midland, a reminder that, in addition to Brunel's Great Western, the city of Bath was once served by the Midland Railway, here at Green Park Station perhaps better remembered as the northern terminal of the Somerset and Dorset line, and full of memories for me. I used to stand here, willing enginemen to invite me onto the footplate. Little did I then imagine that the passage of 30 years would, in turn, witness closure, dereliction, and now the superb restoration of the station, albeit to serve primarily as a car park to an adjacent superstore. Today, if we wish to travel over the Mendips to Evercreech Junction, it must be by car. And here, where steam once ruled, the surroundings now echo to the sounds of other motive power. To most people, the Somerset and Dorset was a holiday line. The majority of heavily loaded through trains, running only on summer Saturdays, required the combined power of two locomotives. Such were the gradients over the Mendip Hills. But the pride of the line, the Pines Express, ran daily throughout the year, Sundays accepted, between Manchester and Bournemouth. It was at the Midland station that Ivo took his first railway photograph in 1925. Today, close to the spot where trains departed, is an aptly named road. For nearly 60 years, until his recent illness, Ivo has recorded the changing railway scene throughout the British Isles. But it is no secret that his favourite line was the Somerset and Dorset, with its close-knit family of dedicated railwaymen, for whose skills Ivo had the highest regard. Many were to become his friends and still visit or correspond with him at his home in Bath. Amongst them, Fireman Peter Smith. Because I, I was photographing on the s and before Peter appeared on the scene, and um, my first photographs of Donald were with your predecessor, Peter, um, Frank Stickley. Yes, that's right. Who was Donald's fireman. And then you appeared. Yes, it must have been through Donald that I met Peter. Yes, I think I first met you at um, Bath Green Park because you were then in the, um, in the habit of um, issuing out photographs that you'd taken perhaps a week previous uh, to um, drivers and firemen. And you used to have extra prints um, done for us. And I believe we um, ran in one day on the pines and you were on the end of the platform and said, uh, oh, here you are, some photographs for you. Some that I took last Saturday. And uh, that was our first meeting. Mm. That's this would have been in about 1954. Peter's old driver, Donald Beale, is also commemorated here in Bath, where, in 1919, he first joined the Somerset and Dorset Railway. When filmed by Ivo in 1962, Donald's locomotive handling over the S&D was already becoming legendary. Well, he was a charming man, um, and yet nearly all the... Uh, drivers on the S&D were, were charming people. It was very, very rare to find someone who, who wasn't pleasant. Yes, Donald, of course, was an absolute charmer. Twenty-two years later, Donald, now a youthful 83, is back amongst old friends. His fireman, Peter Smith, and colleagues David Massey and Ray Stokes, both ex-S&D engine men. When they extended the service, well, 
evening started running around with three coaches on. John Thorne took ten up last Saturday with a nine. He did, did Frightened him how easy she took the bank. He couldn't understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could understand it. He oh. looked back to see if Henry dropped a couple off somewhere. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> oh, no, they, they're no engine for death, indeed. They were. Yes. Anything, they, uh, anything wrong with it? They came too late, didn't they? That's, that's the trouble. We've done with them years before. That's right, and they would have saved the Somerset and Dorset. That's right, yeah. At Cranmore, Donald and Peter are reunited with another old friend. Loco number 92203, on which Donald first taught Peter to drive. The engine is now restored to working order here on David Shepherd's East Somerset Railway. Having an oil up there, Uh huh, just doing a little bit, Pete. Taking a few corks back here and there. Yeah, I've done that one. Ah, dee, dee, dee. Go on then, Donald, come and show us how it should be done. Right on. Come on then, Peter. Come on, uh -huh. Peter. You know all the way around, don't you? Uh-huh. There you are, uh -huh. mate. That's your seat. Uh -huh. <laughs> Lovely. OK. Think you can find your way about? Yes. With a bit of luck. Oh. Forgot what a long way up it was, Peter. Welcome aboard. Thanks very much. Hello, Donald. Hello. All right? Yes, thanks, Mike. How are you? Not too bad. What's it like to be back in the old driving seat oh, again, then? Oh, fine. Hey? Fine. Quite like old times. Getting off from Bath, um, first of all, you came to Bath Junction. Then you had to climb out of Bath, which was one in 50, climbing up to Devonshire Tunnel. Anyway, you came out of Devonshire Tunnel into Lincoln Vale. That was a very beautiful spot. And still climbing at 1 in 15, and came up into a little wooded section at the end. In the early spring, Peter and I decided to revisit some of Ivo's favourite lineside locations between Bath and Evercreech Junction. 
we headed first to the summit of the two-mile climb out of Bath at the southern end of Lincoln Vale, an isolated and, in summer, a picturesque location. Right. And often we used to see them across here in the field, of course. Um, we used to take broadside shots of us on the Pines Express. Yes, well, that was possible mm -hmm. in those days, but it wouldn't be now. I mean, it's, that well, was all grass then, wasn't well, it? It was all overgrown, down trees and, and so on. It's incredible, really, to come back and see it. Yeah. Oh, look, there's the old uh, brick base to the linesman's hut that was oh, yeah. situated there. Yeah. Of course, when the line was uh, first opened in, was it 1874? That's right. It was single track all the way down to Evercrees, wasn't it? Well, yes, but of course, later on, much of the line was doubled. My favourite spot of mine there was just above the entrance to Coombe Down Tunnel. And in the spring, when the um, spring green was about on the trees. It was quite delightful. Amazing when you think, Peter, the entire 26 miles from Bath Junction down to Evercreech were built in just two years. Yeah, it was amazing. In incredible feat of engineering, really, wasn't it? Well, Peter, here we are, Coombe Down Tunnel. I don't suppose you used to want to hang around in here too long? Well, not really, Mike. I mean, this tunnel was just over a mile long and uh, extremely... Um, Restricted bore. If you had a large engine, it was only about 12 inches from the top of the chimney to the roof. I suppose that explains this, the old build-up of the uh, soot. Well, I think I probably contributed to some of that. You, yeah. you reckon you yeah. put half an inch I of that on there, do you? Yeah. I probably do, in actual fact. But, of course, these, uh, this tunnel and the similar Devonshire tunnel, they, they were really bad for um, foot plate men because uh, they were on steep gradients. And, of course, the engine would be... Um, laboring for a tunnel like this. I mean, this particular tunnel, if you're on a northbound freight, you will be traveling pretty slowly through here, and the engine will be working extremely hard, and of course all the exhaust fumes yeah. will be going down off the chimney and uh, choking the footplate crew, and uh, it certainly wasn't pleasant at all. So you swept down through Coombe Down Tunnel, and you popped out the other end into Horsecombe Vale, which was, oh, superb scenery, absolutely magnificent. And the gradient increased to 1 in 55 down, and you swept down over Tacky Mill Viaduct, and then on down past the grounds of Midford Castle, and then you came to the little Midford Station, all single line. Well, to me, Peter, of course, this was the most picturesque section of the entire line, down through Midford Station and well, along the Midford Valley. Well, of course, Mike, you're biased, aren't you? I mean, uh, <laughs> you used to work the signal box here, didn't you? So they tell me. Well, better not say too much about that. No. Oh, look, Peter, they've um, taken down the overgrowth here, and that's oh, the yeah. sort of view you used to get all the way along through the uh, uh, length of Midford Station, which we're approaching now. And there's the old Great Western line from Limpistoke to Camerton over on the bridge there. Oh, yes, Where they filmed yes. the Titfield Thunderbolt in That's, 1952. I remember, yes. No, I think, actually, um, the first photograph of Ivo's that I saw was taken at Midford. Yeah. I thought then, what a marvellous place, how beautiful. And it still is, isn't it, Mike? It is, yeah. Yeah, even the sun comes out at Midford, you see. But, of course. <laughs> let's, let's walk on down and try and find the station. Right. Oh, just along here, Peter, is where one of the signal wires used to uh, run underneath the platform. Yeah, there, there's the pulley wheel just there, you see. Oh, yes, there it is. We used to work all the expresses to Bath, and so we used to flash through here at some speed, and we didn't see the incidental details, if you like. I know, you used to come through a bit too fast sometimes. You used to rattle the windows in the box, Peter. Oh, is that right? Uh. <laughs> Midford box, um, it was quite magnificent. It was always absolutely spotless. There'd never be a trace of dirt anywhere. And the brass was cleaned every day. And the floor was uh, polished at least twice a week. And this was done mainly by two signalmen, um, the late Percy Savage and the late Harry Wiltshire. Sadly, they both died now. But Percy and Harry, um, two absolutely charming people, uh, gentlemen in the true sense of the term, and what absolutely staggered me was that the very last day that the Somerset and Dorset was open, all the brass was cleaned and the floor was polished just as, just as usual. Now, it's 
so sad, Peter, to see all this desolation of something that you would have thought would have gone on forever. Indeed. Let's have a look at this picture I've brought along of Ivo's. Now, we're stood in exactly the same spot that he took this picture oh, back in yeah. the 50s. Well, the old viaduct's still there, Peter, and uh, the pub. Let's go down and have a pint. Never mind the pint. Mike, I thought you were going to tell me about your courting date in the signal box at Midfield. Ah, well, I promised Sandra we wouldn't mention that. Sadly, not a foot of track remains between Bath and Evercreech, but the Somerset and Dorset Railway Trust found a home and established a museum here at Washford on the West Somerset Railway. One exhibit in particular recaptures for me the atmosphere of the old line. It's the creation of Peter Catamol. Midford Box. This brings back special memories for me, Peter. How on earth did you manage to recreate this so accurately? Well, it's thanks to Ivo and his marvellous photographs, because from those we've collected together all this stuff here and recreated the interior of the old Midford Box, right down to the lever plates and, and, and the lever descriptions. Are any of these from Midford Box? There's or? just one item from the old Midford Box, and all the rest has come from Southampton and from British Rail elsewhere. And what's the one item? One item's number 14 plate. Oh, the old up inner home. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And all the brass work we polish up, and it all most of it works now. And whether you would like to try your hand at reliving 25 years ago <laughs> in our box here, well, we'll have a go. Let's see if we can. Uh, let's see if we can put a down train to Wellow. Well, there, there's the duster. Oh, you must, take it yes, over. Yes, indeed. Train on for Wellow, then, Mike. Right, let's have a go. Long time since I've done this. <laughs> a little bit easier to pull than they used to be. Yeah, I thought they might be. Don't forget your number four. No. And then there's a big pull coming up for the distant. Over she goes. That's it. To you. What have we got in here, Mike? Oh, well, we st Still a little bit missing, I see. Yes, but uh, it's not that far away. <laughs> Another of the Trust's more ambitious projects, anyway, yeah. led by Mike Palmer, Definitely. is the restoration to full working order of S&D Class 7F, number 53808. When Ivo filmed the same engine at Bath in the early 60s, she was nearing the end of 39 years' service on the S&D, during which period Ivo must have photographed her on countless occasions. A number of railmen would have a great collection of photographs, thanks to Ivo. And it's certainly a collection, in my case, is something which I shall always treasure. And also, we were always pleased if we had the opportunity to um, give him a footplate ride, which Donald Bill and I did on a, a number of occasions. It, it made me feel very humble at times, the way th these expert railwomen uh, would welcome me sort of uh, with open arms. Uh, I was a pure amateur. Uh, and yet, uh, wherever I went on a Saturday, um, I'd be, say, welcomed with open arms and, and had delightful treatment by all and sundry. This is the um, camera I used, which was um, Bell and Howell. And I did all my filming in 16 millimeter and all in color. Most of my shots were done on a tripod. Uh, very early on, I'd been given a lecture by a professional saying, Ivo, you must remember that what you are filming is doing the moving, you are not. And um, I was also given very wise instruction early on about practicing panning. Uh, panning is where you swing the camera on its tripod, keeping as close as you can focused on the engine of one sweet swing through. The slightest hesitation or the slightest jerk in panning, and when you see it on the screen, you'll, you'll be horrified. Think, gosh, what have I done? The once picturesque Midsummer Norton was a frequent winner of the best kept station competition, an award it well deserved, as each summer the station was bedecked with superb floral displays.
following years of dereliction, the buildings and the gardens are now to be restored by the Avon Training Agency. After climbing a further two miles, the line passed through a short tunnel close to the village of Chilcompton. This was another of Ivo's favourite locations. And of course, on heavy drain, you'll be really pounding away here. This is a steady 153 gradient uh, heading towards Malmesbury at this point. And uh, on heavy drain, you'll be really into them. Yeah. It'll be a lovely sound coming out of the exhaust. I suppose a steam engine is the nearest from mechanical thing to a living creature. Uh, it behaved almost like a living creature. It responded to human treatment. If it was well fired and well driven, it would repay that handsomely. Uh, and equally well, it was a very faithful machine. And of course, the, the overall effect of a steam locomotive climbing hard uphill, you had this sort of exhaust being poured out the chimney, and uh, the sound was tremendous. Just two miles short of the summit of the railway at Masbury, the line passed through Binnegar. Here, Peter and I met up with another old friend, Norman Down, who was station master here, and today still lives in the old station house. It's, it's very sad to see it like this, I must say. I just can hardly recognize the place. Well, it used to, be, used to be such a busy place, didn't it? And now you're living here, Norman, more or less in isolation. Yes, we don't get the uh, pines through in the morning like we used to, with Don giving the familiar wave as he went by. Not much of it left now. Very little, little now, Mike. Uh, signal box used to be here. Yeah. The waiting room. The station buildings, are, of course, were on this side, with the waiting rooms and uh, porter's mm -hmm. room. And how did it feel when you saw it all being raised to the ground? Because you'd been here, what, 20-odd 20, 20 years? Yes, yes. We felt then that uh, it was a sad day to see it bulldoze down the way they did. The station itself would have made, in my opinion, an ideal bungalow for someone. Yes. So. Of course, once a year, Norman, you used to get a special delivery by train, courtesy of Ivo, I believe. Oh, yes, Ivo. He was very kind in uh, always sending his album photographs to all stations. Uh, it used to arrive by train so that all the staff could go through it. And uh, in due course, we'd notify the next station that would be on the way to them. And that way it would go all the way down the line, right would it? through the line. Yeah. This was a very yeah. nice gesture on Ivo's part. Of course, Norman, um, you were active, weren't you, in trying to uh, prevent the closure of the, of the line? Well, they were better times, Peter. We, we didn't like it. We didn't like their methods and uh, traffic being uh, deliberately uh, taken away from us to make it look, make the picture look really bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, census of passengers taken when school children were on holiday to make the numbers lower, that sort of thing. It was a, a bad way of doing it. In happier days, Ivo, in his faithful Bentley, would often chase a train, managing to photograph it at several locations on the long climb to Masbury Summit. Oh, one had great fun chasing trains and seeing how many times you could photograph the train uh, between, should we say, points A and B. And uh, more often than not, the crews on the locomotives were fully aware of what you were doing. And they would more or less say, uh, right, we'll try to well see we get to Marsby Summit before Ivo does. Well, we've come eight miles uphill from Radstock, Pete, and uh, this is again one of Ivo's favourite locations, but not on a day like this, I would imagine. Well, I wouldn't think so. I mean, the weather today is absolutely abysmal, isn't it? Well, we're over the top now. Uh, downhill all the way now, is it, to every creature, apart from one little short stretch? Yeah, it's just a, just a short stretch through Shepton Mallet, but, but uh, virtually all downhill. 
Here, at last, on the downhill section south of Masbury, the train crew could afford to relax and on sunny summer days enjoy the delights of the rolling Mendip countryside. Evercreech Junction, where once passengers could change trains for stations to Burnham-on-Sea, Bridgewater or even Wells. The engines which hauled the heavy freight traffic over the Mendips were turned here at Evercreech, prior to setting off back to Bath. Here too, Peter and I decided to turn back, but not before saying farewell to Ray Stokes. This is the end of the line for us then, Peter. That's right, Mike. But of course, this is only the first 26 miles of the line. And uh, if we were on the Pines Express now, there's another 46 miles to go yet to Bournemouth. And then of course you had the branch up to Highbridge and uh, Burnham. That's right, that branch off to the left, it's about a half a mile from here. And that's where you that's where we came, came in, in from Temple Coombe, Ray. That's right. I suppose you still think about the old line, Ray, do you? Oh, very often, yes. Um, God, you can't forget it, Eden. Um, but when you come to look at it, places like this, this is the first time I've been in here now since we retired, uh, since we closed. And you just can't, you can't imagine what it was like now. Uh, you forget all about it. I mean, it's altered it all. Um, it's impossible now to think um, what the line used to be like. The only yeah. thing is you've got your memories and uh, you can remember it as it was. On our way back to Bath, I took Peter to one final location, the viaduct at Presley, just south of Shepton Mallet. Well, Peter, I've brought you up here at Presley just to have a look at this. I... My word. Really is Literally, the end of the line. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Incredible. That's just how it must have looked when, before they built the railway. I suppose In 18, 1872, they must have started yeah. building this. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Very, very sad. I started filming the S&D um, in 1958 and I didn't appreciate um, what I was doing really. I, I did it because I, I loved the S&D and I thought what fun to be filming it. But at no time uh, whilst I was filming the S&D did I think well this is going to be unique in, in some years to come. That never crossed my mind. As we go to sleep sometimes, uh, instead of counting sheep, I uh, picture myself now working a train from Evercreek Junction up over to Mendips. I try to visualise everything, every little detail, you know, perhaps as you've got by the goods yard, we used to see the shunters come out and uh, they'd have waved to us and that. And, and I try to visualise all that in every signal. And by doing that, I don't think I've got past Shepton Mallet yet. <laughs> 